This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Today's program starts with an overview of the updated 2023 pest guides from our entomology department here at K-State. Jeff Whitworth shares highlights of the valuable resources offered and also advice for producers that are worried about winter wheat pests such as winter grain mites, army cutworms, and hessian flies. Also ahead, Jeremy Cowan, an assistant professor in sustainable food systems here at K-State, joins us to share insight on upcoming programs at the university, such as hands-on learning experiences for high schoolers in a K-State student community garden that will help produce food for the university dining facilities. We end with this week's horticulture piece featuring K-State Research and Extension Director of Publications, Mark Statlander. And today he shares publications available through the KSRE bookstore, specifically on gardening in Kansas. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by Jeff Whitworth. He is our K-State field crop entomologist for several updates. But before we get into those updates, first and foremost, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Anytime. So today we wanted to start with some updates on publications from you all in entomology. So there is a new crop pest guide, which I guess I should say updated, not new. Yes. You know, we're constantly, it may not seem like to all the growers out there, but we're constantly trying to stay abreast of the situation as far as pests go and as far as the new products that are available for application to help manage or control these pests. And those change daily or more often than daily. So we're always trying to keep up with those. But one of the new publications, it's really not new, it's just an update of we came out 10 years ago with Crop Pests of Kansas book of references for most of the uh, pests that we have in all of our crops, plus a little bit about biological control. Uh, We're really proud of that when we came out 10 years ago. But you know what? It sold out last year. So I guess we should be proud of that also, right? But before they did a second printing, we went in to update it. So the second edition has a different picture on the front. So you can tell it from the first edition. The questions I've already gotten is, should I just throw away my first edition? I wouldn't, but I don't get anything from selling extra books. So it doesn't matter. But the first edition is still valid. The second edition, it's just an update. So in the last 10 years, we came up with some different economic injury levels or different treatment thresholds for some of the pests. That We've had some new invasive species. Probably the most common, most widespread is the sugarcane aphid. Now it's even called the sorghum aphid. So you can see these things change all the time. But generally speaking, the biology doesn't change or the history of the insect in Kansas doesn't change a lot. But the book just came out the early part of January, so it should be available through your K-State bookstores. And the nice thing, Franny Miller, our pesticide coordinator for K-State, she authorized five books for each local office. So each local county extension office has five issues, and I think they already have them on hand. So if you go down there, you can go down and talk to your agent about how to get one. Maybe if you are really nice, they'll just hand you one. But one of the things I might add, it has nothing in there about insecticides or the application of insecticides. It has some general information about applying treatments or controls, whether they're mechanical or physical or chemical or whatever, but it doesn't have anything about the insecticides. So if you're interested in what insecticides to use, we're trying to answer that question also. And we do that annually with our crop insect management guides. So the major crops in Kansas, uh, alfalfa, corn, sorghum, soybeans, sunflowers, wheat, we have a crop insect guide. And those should be out probably by the 1st of March. And every year what we do with those, we solicit all the agricultural representatives in the area for any new changes to their agricultural chemicals, i.e. expansion of labels or contraction of labels or doing away with a particular product like corp pyrophos, which they uh, banned last year, that kind of stuff. So those crop insect management guides, they are up-to-date information as far as we can determine because, as I said, they change almost daily, the labels do. So we always also put a qualifier in there that always 
always check your label. That is a legal document, so you got to make sure you check the label before and after you apply whatever insecticide it is to your crop. But we've tried to give you some information in those management guides on sampling, uh, what to expect from damage, and that kind of stuff. So the book is a reference for you know the biology, a little little more information on, relative to biology and history of most of our major insect crop pests and mites. And then if you need more up-to-date information relative to 2023 on what insecticides to apply, uh, you can go to the crop insect management guides. And they're all available through the uh, entomology extension um, website. And actually, it's really easy to just click them on and download them for free. Or I always try and get growers to go see their local county extension agents just to get to know them, find out all the information that they can provide on a wide range of topics and just establish a good relationship there. But that's what I kind of wanted to make sure everybody's aware of. You know, before we get into the planting season, that these reference materials are available or will be shortly. The book is available now and the insect management guide should be within the next uh, month. Wonderful. Well, an excellent list of resources that I know producers will be looking forward to checking out. So I'll link to all of those in the show notes of today's program, as always, which can be found on agtoday.net. But Jeff, before we wrap up here, you also wanted to talk about some wheat pests as well that you've already been getting calls about, believe it or not. Yes. You know, here it is, the middle of winter, right? You know, it's been relatively warm the last couple of weeks. I mean, relatively cold, warm, hot. But every time it warms up in mid-January, and it usually does every year, we have have a week or two of relatively warm weather, I get calls about winter grain mites in wheat. Now, winter grain mites can be in any grass. They can be in brome or even on the turf on golf courses, but they're not noticed. When they do get noticed is when they're in wheat. And when it was relatively warm, I got some calls from uh, some of the uh, consultants, actually, in the south central part of the state about winter grain mites. Most winter grain mites are in the egg stage right now. There are a few active uh, nymphs and adults, but most are in the egg stage. There are some upfeeding on on the leaves. If you just are really bored and you really want something to do, you go out at night with a flashlight in your wheat and you can see a few winter grain mites on a warm night, even now. Now, when I say warm, 30 degrees, uh, 26, 27 degrees, up to 50. If it's colder than that, they'll be down in the soil. But they're going away and they're not really going to do any damage. There's three pests right now, at least that can cause people to think about early season problems, and that's winter grain mites, army cutworms, and hessian flies. They're all three active going into late fall, early winter. Generally speaking, winter grain mites, they die off and there's just eggs left over winter. The army cutworm, however, will be out there feeding as a very small worm anytime the temperature's over 45 to 50 degrees. And just last week, I found some army cutworms in a wheat field because there were a bunch of blackbirds out feeding in a field. In my mind, that's usually indicative of army cutworms or some sort of worm infestation. And this time of year, it's generally army cutworms because the others have passed away. So I did actually go out there, and this is down by Newton, uh, and there were some army cutworms. They're really small, so you have to really look. And then you have the hessian fly. And the hessian fly is dormant right now. It's in the flaxseed stage. If you have some place in your wheat field where last fall, what the growers always tell me, it looks like it's going backwards or kind of dying out or has kind of a dark bluish grayish color to the leaves and they're a little more flattened, go out and look. And if you pull those up and you start stripping those uh, tillers, you'll see the little mahogany colored cigar shaped flaxseed. That's the resting stage or the pupil stage of the hessian fly. So all three of those pests are out there. As soon as it starts warming up, the winter grain mite eggs will hatch. The flax seed will turn into adult hessian flies, and the army cutworms will continue to grow. The key right now is the wheat's in dormancy. Same with alfalfa. You know, I get calls about alfalfa weevils also early on. If the crop's in dormancy, if it's still dormant, they're not going to feed on it very much. Or even if they do, it's not going to cause any problems. It's once these crops, mainly wheat, come out of dormancy and start growing that we start having a problem with actually army cutworms and winter grain mites. Hessian fly also, but that's usually a little further down the line because they have to build up another uh, generation or two before they cause problems. 
But if the wheat's not out of dormancy, they're not going to affect it. The other problem we're having right now in a large part of the state, we're still short on moisture, especially in soil moisture. You know, we've gotten a little bit of snow here and there, a little rain or wintery mix, but it hasn't really done enough good to help the crops going into March. Now, it's not going to cause much of a problem while they're still in dormancy. But if we go into March or late February, whenever these crops break dormancy, if there is an army cutworm problem or if there is a winter grain mite problem, that damage is going to show up even more because those plants are also struggling for moisture. So what we really need between now and 1st of March, we need some good moisture, some nice soaking rains or snows. And then that will help mitigate any problems that we may have with army cutworm or winter grain mites or eventually uh, uh, hessian flies. But right now, they're out there. It's a good idea to go out and try and figure out where those populations are, but you don't need to do anything about them right now. You had a producer that was eager in this down period. I know we say downtime, and that's not really true, but this period of time. I I didn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) But this slower period of time, then producers are eager to do something. So they're thinking about treating, but now it's not really the time to do that. No, and they're always, you know, they say, yeah, I remember that weak spot out in the wheat I had. Now's the time to go out and look at it. I got a little bit of time, right? Yeah, and it is a good time. Go out and figure out why you had a weak spot or why you had a thin spot in your wheat or your alfalfa. Now it's a good time to do it, but it's not time. If it's due to an insect or a mite, it's not time to take action because actually the insecticides or miticides, they don't work very well when the temperature is below 50 degrees. But the plants are in dormancy, so even if they do feed on it, it's not going to impact the spring growth or the yield because the roots are already set. So just go out and figure out what the problem is, and if it's an insect or a mite, don't worry about trying to find a solution until everything breaks dormancy, and maybe the weather will even help. It may take care of some of the insects or mites anyway. So Great advice today, as always, Jeff, and great insight. And I know producers appreciate it as much as I do, you coming in and speaking with us all today. So thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Once again, that was K-State field crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth joining us for some updates on some publications as well as wheat pests that we might be cognizant of right now. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by Jeremy Cowan. He's an assistant professor in sustainable food production systems here at K-State. And he's joining us now for a conversation on specialty crops and the work going on here at K-State to help youth get involved in that area of agriculture. So, Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You recently received a grant for specialty crop production here at K-State, but it's kind of a follow-up, right, to another project you did? Right. So this is a specialty crop block grant. It's an interesting program. It's USDA funds that are administered by the state. So Kansas Department of Agriculture puts out a call for proposals. In fact, their uh, current call for proposals is out now and due in mid-March. But that is focused specifically on encouraging specialty crop production and consumption here in Kansas state. So this is the second year that we've gotten one of these grants. The first one helped us build infrastructure out at the Willow Lake Student Farm, which I uh, oversee. And this one was a follow-up where we were looking for funding to start putting on some events that focused on recruitment and especially towards uh, bringing high school-aged students to K-State to see specialty crops and a different side of agriculture than what people are typically used to seeing here in Kansas. So a way to get students, high schoolers, more involved and allow them to see a different side of the industry and then hopefully maybe convince them to pursue it in college? Right, yeah. So as a university, we're always looking to draw students in, and our department is no different than any other. Personally, I have a passion for specialty crops, fruits and vegetables specifically, and sharing that is why we're here. And so if we can bring more students an awareness that it's even a field, that there are options for growing fruits and vegetables here in Kansas, and that that K-State offers educational resources and opportunities in specialty crops. I think that's a great thing to get out there. And we have a facility where we can do that. And so that was the idea. Well, it's a wonderful opportunity. We're going to talk through some of those events now. But you guys have a great facility. You mentioned the student farm that you all have, and it includes a new orchard that you guys recently put up. So a lot of room for growth. So the first program that you really wanted to talk about to target youth today was high school students, obviously thinking about college, where they want to go 
detail, but it's a winter bonfire event that's coming up. Right. So on March 3rd, we're partnering with the College of Ag to host the Kansas Youth Initiative students at the Willow Lake Student Farm, where we're going to have a bonfire with bonfire type of activities. But more specifically, we're going to focus on trying to show these kids what kinds of things we can do at the farm. So we'll bring out some of our tractors and other uh, powered equipment and The non-powered equipment tends to be a little less exciting, but we'll give them the opportunity to take a spin on them and see how we use those tools to grow specialty crops. Absolutely. A great opportunity for students to learn. And part of that event, you mentioned hands-on learning experiences. And will tours be included at that event as well? Yeah. So we'll put on a one tour at, towards the beginning just to kind of get everybody familiar with where they are. We've got a few different research plots and some production plots that are really out of the norm for this area. Actually, for probably most of the country. So my position I was hired to focus on permaculture and regenerative techniques or alternative cropping systems. So we have first of its kind research plots on hugel culture, which is a really strange thing from the outside, but we've built these big mounds by burying logs and uh, have used those to show that north-facing slopes can make a appreciable difference in the seasonality of producing some crops. We've showed that lettuce, uh, we can get it in earlier if we plant on the north side, and we can keep it later when we plant on the south side, and that could be a strategy for farmers in marginal regions or that want to get those specialty crops off in very questionable times of the year. And so pretty certain that most students in college or high school and probably a lot of farmers here in Kansas have never seen anything like this. And so it'll be novel. It'll be strange. And I think it'll be something that will be memorable to see some of those kinds of things that we've got going on. Yeah, I'm enticed. I want to come out and tour the farm if you guys would have me at some point. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, Yeah, great opportunity for kids to learn. And I know that's not the only event you all have coming up. I guess March is springtime here, but later this spring, you're going to have an additional event as well. And we're going to hear more about this at a later date for when it's actually announced, but it's going to be a program available for high schoolers again. Right. So the later spring event, it's our spring field day where we have folks come out. And last year we did a series of workshops depending on whether or not we have this correspond with the state FFA convention or uh, College of Ag's open house will dictate how much time we're going to try to get people out there for. But last year when we did this, this was it was again funded by that specialty crop block grant. We put on four workshops during that event. We uh, gave people an introduction to mushrooms and mushroom production. We did a beekeeping workshop. We did an introduction to Hugo culture and we did a tools for small farms. And I think it went really well this year. We're hoping to not just attract folks from K-State and from the surrounding community, but to try to encourage, especially high school ag students, but any high school student that we can bring out to show, hey, look, here's a different side of ag that does happen in Kansas, can happen in Kansas, and should happen in Kansas. So if anybody's tuning in and they have, you know, high school age students or they happen to teach in an ag classroom or something like that, and they have students that might be interested, we said that this will be announced later on the exact date. But if they're wanting to follow along and keep up, where can they find that at? Oh, that's a great question. So we're working on getting all of that posted to our website. So it's all gotten through the H&R, the Horticulture Natural Resources website. We're literally working on getting that all dialed in right now. And uh, I'd be happy to share that link once we have it. People are welcome to email me at jscowan, C-O-W-A-N, at ksu.edu, and I'm happy to share details as those start to become more solid. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll be sure to share that too as the time goes on and when we get closer to the date that it's actually announced. So no worries there. I'll be sure to link to that in your email as well in the show notes of today's show, which can be found on agtoday.net as always. But Jeremy, we're not done talking here. There's another program that you guys are going to get started a part of this grant and it's the student garden that you guys are hoping to start. It's almost a community garden, but for K-State students, right? Right. So yes, the student garden program, it's going to be a new program. Actually, it's a resurrected program. My predecessor started something like this back in, um, oh, 2008 or nine, uh, when the student farm was first created. And the idea is it'll be a community garden uh, available to students. For this year, because it's a new program, we're not going to put as many prerequisite requirements on students. There will be a limited number of slots available, but there will be two different categories of participants for this. One category would be your traditional community garden type of 
situation where you get a little plot. You get to take care of that as you wish. As long as you're taking care of it, you get to keep it. The fees will probably be minimal. If any, there will probably be a security deposit. But then the other category of participant will be what we're going to call maybe a pro track. Folks who want to get real hands-on farming experience in a production type of setting where uh, we're going to be providing a 25-box CSA to the campus community this year. For people who don't know what that is, it's community-supported agriculture or a subscription box where you purchase in advance the subscription, and we have drop-offs once a week. Our uh, CSA will go for 16 weeks, and throughout that 16 weeks, we'll have our student garden program students helping to produce, clean, pack, and deliver to our drop-off points that produce. And so we also are working with campus housing and dining to to provide food to campus dining halls. We've been providing vegetables to uh, Kramer and Derby dining halls, and then also to JP Sports Grill, both at the Union as well as over by Jardine. And so uh, all of those are venues for the produce that we want to produce, but incorporate into that student garden program. So it will give those students a very hands-on, in-depth look at production from a small to mid-scale, especially crop perspective. Yeah, from seed to finish, honestly. I mean, seeing it in their own dining halls, what an incredible idea. This is such a great opportunity for students. Right. Yeah, I'd feel somewhat remiss if I didn't mention that we not only got this specialty crop block grant, but uh, a huge boost from Kubota. They've provided us with some of the equipment that we'll be showing during the uh, winter bonfire to the students there. Uh, And they're helping to uh, establish with... K-State Housing and Dining uh, by K-State for K-State campaign. And it's it's all been fairly surreal how everything's come together. Just the, there's this marriage that's forming between the various farms on campus. It's not just ours, but there are other uh, departments and, and farms that are working with housing and dining to provide food produced by K-State for K-State. That's wonderful. Well, teamwork always makes the dream work. And I feel like here at K-State, we're pretty good at that, right? Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Well, Jeremy, I can't thank you enough for your time today. This conversation has been so fun and a bit different from our usual content on the show, but definitely something interesting. And I feel like if students are listening, a lot of stuff for them to look forward to. Yeah, reach out and uh, we hope to be able to get you here. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that is Jeremy Cohen. He is an assistant professor in sustainable food production systems here at K-State. Joining us for a conversation on specialty crops and some programs going on here at the university. We're cutting to a short break now, but when we return, we'll be closing out today's show with this week's horticulture piece. This week, we're doing something a bit different. We'll be featuring K-State Research and Extension's Director of Publications, Mark Statlander. Mark is known for commonly sharing in conversations that there's a pub for that. So today, he'll be sharing insight on publications available through the K-State Research and Extension bookstore, specifically on gardening in Kansas. So those listening, if that's something that interests you, be sure to stay tuned, and we'll be back with that in more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. I'm joined now by K-State Research and Extension Director of Publications, Mark Satlander. He's joining us today for a segment called There's a Pub for That. So some background on There's a Pub for That. Commonly in our team's conversations, we'll be talking about a subject and Mark will say, do you know we have a pub for that? (laughs) So this is an idea that we came up with as a team that we're going to share with you all, where we're just going to talk about resources through K-State Research and Extension through our bookstore, because... The options are limitless, right, Mark? I mean, first and foremost, thanks for being here. Well, thanks. Yes, currently there are more than 1,700 titles in the bookstore library. They cover everything K-State Research and Extension covers. But with the upcoming spring and gardening season, I thought today would be a good day to talk about some of our new and popular gardening publications. Let's start with a ongoing popular publication. It has been out for years and it's currently being updated, the Kansas Garden Guide. If you just want a single resource on how to start a garden in Kansas, this is the resource you need. And in 2022, the Garden Guide was downloaded nearly 36,000 times from our website. Wow, our most popular publication, right? Yes. 
That's incredible. When it comes to the garden guide, some things that it highlights is, you know, different varieties that can be planted in Kansas, zones, I'm assuming, things like that. It starts with what you need to do to prepare a garden site. It talks about preparing the garden, how to compost. It has tables on where you live in the state and when you should plant something. It gives you different times of the year you can plant, but really will walk you through step-by-step on what you need to have a, a vegetable garden in Kansas. Wonderful. No wonder it's such a popular resource. When it comes to gardening titles that we have in our publication repertoire, there's really a lot of diversity, right? It can be anywhere from age-old pros or people that are professionals to backyard gardeners? Yes. We have publications for greenhouse professionals. We have publications geared toward small farmers or people who are interested in farmers markets. But today, what I'd like to talk about, the titles cover home gardening. And again, we we have things from the basics, uh, a beginner's guide on how to make compost, which is a a good use of of waste around your house. And again, the, the garden guide is a good guide for beginners. But as you get more specific, we also have a vegetable garden planning guide, which will guide you through different vegetables, which varieties grow well here, timing of planting. And again, it's a popular publication downloaded from our bookstore website almost 15,000 times in 2022. Wow. And I know a little bit more unique probably than listeners are used to hearing from us, but there was also some publications put out recently by Rebecca McMahon. She authored several publications on gardening and learning opportunities for kids in schools, right? Yes. If your school is interested in starting a school garden, we have two titles that are new that Rebecca authored in 2022. One of the titles is a book on garden templates and plant choices for Kansas school gardens. And another title that Rebecca authored is Considerations and Resources for School Garden Designs, specifically set for in Kansas. And I do know that in those publications, they specifically talk about things that you can wait till the school year starts to plant. And Mark, I know our options are really limitless when it comes to our publications here at K-State Research and Extension. So if you were telling listeners, you know, motivating them to use our publications more, where's a good place for them to find this as a resource? How can they get more information from them? You can always go to your local Extension office. If you're searching on the web, The bookstore website is bookstore.ksre.ksu.edu because so many of us use Google as a search resource. If you want to know more about strawberries and you want to know specifically information from Kansas, if in your Google search bar you type in strawberries, a space, and type ksu.edu, it will first return information from Kansas State University. Wonderful. Well, that's a great tip for sure to be able to find things a bit more easily on the web when it comes to our KSRE publications. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you, Samantha. Absolutely. Once again, everyone, that was K-State Research and Extension Director of Publications, Mark Statlander. This is Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today.